Ave Maria Purissima. Uh, today we're going to take a look at what we've been told about the moral condition of the world in the last times. It's a very uh, important topic. I'm inclined to say an essential topic. And since most of what we've uh, what we we'll cover today, we've spoken of elsewhere. Some of y'all may recognize the themes. As usual, the quotes will be cut, pasted, and edited. Heaven and earth shall pass away, but my words shall not pass away. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, amen. On last Sunday of a liturgical year, and in fact, all through Advent, the Church asks us to consider the end of the world. Obviously, that's an exciting topic. We're not supposed to come unglued when we start thinking about it, though. The example we've given before, but it fits perfectly, is that of St. John Birchman, he's a great Belgian Jesuit. Uh, one day during the time assigned for recreation, St. John Birchman and his fellow Jesuit scholastics were shooting pool, and one of them asked him, hey John, if you found out the world was about to end right now, what would you do? And St. John answered, I'd keep right on shooting pool. Now what's the point? The point is St. John was supposed to be taking recreation at that time, and he was. And he was supposed to be in the state of grace at that time, and he was. In other words, he's doing exactly what he's supposed to be doing at that very moment. And that's exactly what the Lord expects of us. So if we're in the state of grace, and we're doing our duty, we're good to go. The important thing is not so much when in history that we live. The important thing is how we die. That's the important thing. The most important thing is to die in a state of grace, and then we're saved. Okay, so much for the introduction. Let's turn to the topic at hand. Today we'll start with a fascinating passage found in the Catechism of the Catholic Church, and I quote, Before Christ's second coming, the Church must pass through a final trial that will shake the faith of many believers. The persecution that accompanies her pilgrimage on earth will unveil the mystery of iniquity in the form of a religious deception, offering men an apparent solution to their problems at the price of apostasy from the truth. The supreme religious deception is that of the Antichrist, a pseudo-messianism by which man glorifies himself in place of God and of his Messiah come in the flesh. Close quote, the Catechism of the Catholic Church. The Church must pass through a final trial that will shake the faith of many believers in the form of a religious deception, offering men an apparent solution to their problems at the price of apostasy from the truth. Now let's fill that picture in by turning to the Scriptures. We're going to see that Scripture gives us a fairly detailed description about the reaction of the men who live in the last days to truth, as well as the moral conditions that prevail during this final trial. So we'll get started. In chapter three of his second letter to St. Timothy, St. Paul writes, quote, but know this, that in last days, dangerous times will come. Men will be lovers of self, covetous, haughty, proud, blasphemers, disobedient to parents, ungrateful, criminal, heartless, faithless, slanders, incontinent, merciless, unkind, treacherous, stubborn, puffed up with pride, loving pleasure more than God, having an appearance indeed of piety, but disowning its power. These men also resist the truth, for their corrupt in mind, reprobate as regards the faith. Close quote, inspired in their word of God. Now there's a lot there to consider, but we only have time for a few points. In the last days, men will be puffed up with pride and lovers of self. They'll be faithless to the point of being reprobate, meaning they have so abused grace that as a just punishment, they will no longer seriously or intelligently care about their internal salvation. They'll be incontinent, meaning they will be gluttons and burn with lust, and so not surprisingly, they will love pleasure more than they love God. They'll have an appearance of piety, but without the virtue. 
Cornelius the Lapide explains this means they will profess to be Christians, although they should be both very wicked in their works and perverse in their ideas. And because mental integrity is clouded by various lusts and vices, their minds will be corrupted and they'll be resistant to truth. They'll be resistant to truth. In the first chapter of his letter to Romans, St. Paul discusses in some deal, detail both the sin of resisting the truth and the consequences of that sin. Quote, For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and wickedness of men who by their wickedness suppress the truth. For what can be known about God is plain to them. So they are without excuse, for although they knew God, they did not honor him as God or give thanks to him. But they became futile in their thinking, and their senseless minds were darkened. Claiming to be wise, they became fools. Okay, so by sinning against the known truth, their minds have become darkened. That's an automatic consequence of sin, and intellectual sins cause the greatest darkness. Their minds have become darkened. Okay, so we continue. Claiming to be wise, they became fools. Therefore, God gave them up the lusts of their heart to impurity, to the dishonoring of their bodies among themselves. So by sinning against the light of reason, these wicked men have darkened their minds, and as a consequence, God gives them up to impurity. But what does that mean, to say that God gives them up to impurity? That great doctor of the church, St. John Chrysostom, explains that as a punishment for their willful blindness, for their willful rejection of the known truth, God permitted them to fall into the foulest, most shameful, and unnatural sins. In other words, as a just punishment for their pride, as a just punishment for their willful blindness and error, God withdrew his grace, and as a consequence, they plunged into perversion. We continue. For this reason, God gave them up to dishonorable passions. Their women exchanged natural relations for unnatural, and the men likewise gave up natural relations with women who were consumed with passion, con committing shameless acts and receiving in their own persons the due penalty for their error. It's unavoidable. It's completely unavoidable. A people who reject the known truth are doomed to blindness and perversity. A people who reject the known truth are doomed to blindness and perversity. Everybody needs to burn that into his mind. A people that reject the known truth are doomed to blindness and perversity. If you want a one sentence explanation for the state of our society, there it is. A people that reject the known truth are doomed to blindness and perversity. And there are no political solutions to this problem. There are no political solutions to this problem. None. None whatsoever. And the scriptures make it very clear that an outbreak of this San Francisco type behavior isn't the only result of denying the known truth. Listen to this list of sinful, vicious behaviors that sprout up in the wake of denying the known truth. St. Paul. And since they did not see fit to acknowledge God, God gave them up to a base mind and to improper conduct. They were filled with all manner of wickedness, evil, covetousness, malice, full of envy, murder, strife, deceit, malignity, they are gossips, slanders, haters of God, insolent, haughty, boastful, inventors of evil, disobedient to parents, foolish, faithless, heartless, ruthless. Though they know God's decree that those who do such things deserve to die, they not only do them, but approve those who practice them. Close quote, the inspired inerrant word of God. So that's a scriptural list of the rotten fruits of resisting the known truth. St. Paul has more to say in his first letter to St. Timothy. We turn to chapter 4. Quote, now the Spirit expressly says that in the last times, some will depart from the faith, 
giving heed to spirits of error and doctrines of devils, speaking lies hypocritically and having their conscience seared. Close quote. Inspired inerrant word of God. Now the Greek word St. Paul used here for lies means false words. And in today's gospel, we read at the end of the world, there shall arise false Christs and false prophets. And the commentary in this line directs us to look to St. Peter chapter 2, where we read about false teachers. So scripture makes this remarkable contrast. On the one hand, we have the true teacher, the true prophet, the true word, the true Christ, who is made flesh and dwelt amongst us, who speaks only true words. And on the other hand, we have the scriptures warning us in the last times that we false Christ and false prophets and false teachers performing false signs and false wonders and preaching a false faith with false words, hypocritical false words, doctrines of devils spoken by men who apostatize and who are guided by evil spirits. There's this unbelievable contrast between truth and falsity. Now speaking of the great signs and wonders performed by the false Christ and false prophets, which will seduce many, Cornelius the Lapide explains that people will not be seduced, quote, by the strength of seducers, but by the negligence of the seduced, close quote. In other words, in those days, if someone is seduced by a false prophet or a false teacher, it'll be due, due to his own negligence. It'll be his own fault. That those who are seduced by these lies are seduced because they want to be seduced. Now, we're all familiar with that kind of behavior, whether we're talking about the girl sitting at the end of the bar who knows darn good and well that the guy hitting on her is lying through his teeth but she keeps listening because she wants to be seduced. Or whether we're talking about the people who head off to Magigoria. They bought their ticket, they put their money down, and they're gonna have a spiritual experience. That old devil's even happier, in a manner of speaking, than the guy that took the girl out of the bar. The people who are seduced by these lies are seduced because they want to be seduced. Okay, so we've been considering the meaning of 1 Timothy 4, verses 1 and 2. Now the Spirit expressly says that in the last times some will depart from the faith, giving heed to spirits of error and doctrines of devils, speaking lies hypocritically, and having their conscience seared. Cornelius the Lapide explains that this phrase, having a seared conscience, should be understood as meaning having a moral corruption that is so complete that the person is hardened in his evil ways and so he has a complete loss of the sense of sin. In other words, he's become a reprobate. And that's a terrifying state. St. Paul has more to say in 2 Timothy chapter 4, verses 3 and following. For there will come a time where they will not endure the sound doctrine but having itching ears will heap up to themselves teachers according to their own lusts, and they will turn away their hearing from the truth and turn aside, rather, to fables. Now the commentary points out that hearers will run after novelties and teachings which favor their passions. Quinnis Lapide comments, many men devoted to sensual pleasures will seek teachers similar to themselves, who will lead them away from a sound faith and the discipline of a Christian life to heretical errors and a licentious life and corrupt morals. These men, full of vain and carnal desires, have itchy ears. In other words, they love to hear novel things, curious things, soft and effeminate things, sensual things. These men shall seek for themselves teachers who will not sting them with words or scrape where their vices, rather teachers who will deceive them into believing what they wish regarding their sins, by preaching pleasantries worthy of applause. In other words, they don't want to hear the truth because it'll hurt. They don't want to hear the truth because it means they'll have to change their sinful and disordered ways of life and ways of thinking. They'd rather have teachers affirm them in their sins. They'd rather have preachers lie to them. They'd rather have preachers tell them myths and pleasantries They'd rather have teachers tell them what they want to hear 
then correct their false beliefs and vices, perhaps hurt their feelings. They actually want teachers that will tell them things like, how do you know it's wrong if you haven't tried it? It's your body. It's your choice. It's not a sin to use contraception. Don't worry. God made you that way. He's a jerk. Just dump him. You can get an annulment really easily. Don't be so dogmatic. There are many paths to heaven. You don't think a loving God would really send anybody to hell, do you? Okay, so we've taken a quick look at a few scriptures that speak of the moral state of men in the last days. What have we seen? We've seen in those days that men will be puffed up with pride and self-love. They'll love pleasure more than God. They'll profess to be Christians, although they'll should be both very wicked in their works and perverse in their ideas. They'll be resistant to the truth. We've seen that this rejection of the known truth dooms the people to blindness and the worst kinds of sins and perversity. We've considered detailed lists of the sins. Well, we've seen that scripture explicitly teaches that although people know, these such people know that who, those who do these wicked things deserve to die, they not only do them, but approve them in those who practice them. We've seen in the last times there'll be false Christ and false prophets and false teachers performing false signs and false wonders and preaching a false faith with false words, hypocritical false words, doctrines of devils, spoken by men who apostatized and are guided by evil spirits, and that those who are seduced by these lies are seduced because they want to be seduced. We've seen that men won't want to hear the truth because it'll hurt, because it means they'll have to change their sinful and disordered ways of life and ways of thinking. We've seen they'd rather have teachers affirm them in their sins and lie to them than correct their false beliefs and vices and hurt their feelings. Now we've seen the resistance to the truth results in moral corruption so complete that a man becomes hardened in his evil ways and has a complete loss of the sense of sin that's commonly known as being a reprobate. So if we're going to summarize what we've seen so far, the last times will be characterized by a social atmosphere that's absolutely basted in lies and deception, filled with people who are deliberately and obstinately resistant to the truth, and therefore live with deprived minds and depraved morals. So we're getting a much clearer picture of what the Catechism means when it states that the Church must pass through a final trial that will shake the faith of many believers in the form of a religious deception, offering men an apparent solution to their problems at the price of apostasy from the truth. Now let's step back from a more panoramic view of the situation. In 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, St. Paul tells us that, quote, Let no one deceive you in any way, for the day of the Lord will not come unless the apostasy comes first and the man of sin is revealed, the son of perdition. Close quote. Here we see scripture explicitly teaches that the day of the Lord, judgment day, the end of the world, can't come lest there first be an apostasy, a great falling away from the true faith, a great revolt against the true faith. And then in the wake of that apostasy, the great apostasy, the man of sin, the son of perdition, the Antichrist be revealed. Blessed John Henry Newman, summarizing the teaching of the fathers on this point, states the fierce and lawless principle, which historically has been repressed by the governing powers, will finally break completely loose in those terrible times, spawning heresy, schism, sedition, revolution, and war. And he states that, quote, the coming of Christ will be immediately preceded by a very often unparalleled outbreak of evil, called by St. Paul an apostasy, a falling away, in the midst of which a certain terrible man of sin and child of perdition, the special and singular enemy of Christ, the Antichrist, will appear. And this will be when revolutions prevail and the present framework of society breaks to pieces. Close quote, Blessed John Henry Newman. So there'll be an absolutely terrible, unprecedented outbreak of evil, during which time society will be torn into pieces, 
by apostasy, heresy, schism, sedition, revolution, and war. Now before we go on, let's pause briefly to make sure we all understand what each of those terms mean. Apostasy. Apostasy means a baptized person who completely rejects Christianity, whole and entire, and either embraces a non-Christian religion, like Islam or Buddhism or Hinduism or Wicca, or has no religion whatsoever. This is a mortal sin against the faith. An apostate loses the faith, and God is under absolutely no obligation to give it back again. Quines lapide. There is no sure sign of reprobation than that anyone should apostatize from the faith. Heresy. Heresy means a baptized person pertinaciously, pertinaciously denies or doubts and a revealed truth of the Catholic faith. In other words, he stubbornly denies the revealed truth even when he's been shown to be wrong. Nowadays, heretics are often called dissenters. Quoning Salapide comments, heresy is Greek for choosing. A heretic, therefore, is one who chooses what he will believe and therefore does not believe those things which must be believed according to the teaching of the doctors in the church. This is also a mortal sin against the faith a heretic loses the faith, and God is under no obligation to give that back to him either. And by the way, when you lose the faith, that means you also lose hope and charity. You've fallen from being a supernatural man to a natural condition. This gift, this priceless gift that was given to you, the faith without which it is impossible to please God at your baptism for those that are baptized in children or as adult converts, that faith You've rejected, and so the whole shoot match is gone. Schism. Schism occurs when either a group or either an, even an individual, while keeping the true faith, nevertheless voluntarily, knowingly, and deliberately separates himself from the unity of the Church by refusing to submit to the legitimate authority of the Pope and or to remain in communion with those who are subject to him. Schism has been called the crystallization of orthodox descent. Cornelius Lapide comments, Schism is a grave and savage sin because of the wrong done to Christ. St. Cyprian and St. Jerome teach that schismatics are worse than the men who crucified Christ because his seamless garment, namely the church, is torn and separated, which not even the Jews and Gentiles who crucified Christ dared to do. Now, unlike apostasy and heresy, piercism is not a sin against the faith because a schismatic individual or group has maintained the faith. What they've done is they've cut themselves off from the vine. Over time, schism typically creeps into heresy because it becomes necessary to not deny the primacy of the Pope. But as such, schism is a mortal sin against charity. Sedition. Sedition is the crime of stirring up a revolt, disturbance, or violence against lawful civil authority with intent to cause its overthrow or destruction. Sedition has to do with organizing and encouraging opposition to government rather than directly participating in its overthrow. Sedition is a mortal sin against peace. Revolution. Revolution is a usually violent attempt by many people to end the rule of one government and start a new one. So that's the big picture in terms of the moral climate of society in the end times. At the time of this great apostasy, this great rebellion, there will be a terrible, unprecedented outbreak of evil. Society will be racked by apostasy, heresy, schism, sedition, revolution, war, and societal breakdown. We turn back to Scripture. 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. And his coming, that is the coming of the Antichrist, is according to the working of Satan, with all power and signs and lying wonders, with all wicked deception to those who are perishing. For they have not received the love of truth that they might be saved. Therefore God shall send them the operation of error, that they may believe falsehood, that all may be judged who have not believed the truth, but have preferred wickedness. But we, brethren, beloved of God, are bound to give thanks to God always for you, because God has chosen you as first fruits unto salvation through the sanctification of the Spirit and belief of the truth. Close quote, the inspired, inerrant word of God. 
So in the midst of all this chaos, in the midst of this societal breakdown and great apostasy, the Antichrist will appear with satanic power and satanic signs and lying wonders, and the Greek here has false miracles, and with all wicked deception. But notice who's going to be deceived. The scriptures are absolutely clear here. As we read this passage again, place, pay close attention to who exactly is going to be deceived by the Antichrist. Quote, those who are perishing have not received the love of truth that they might be saved. Therefore God shall send them the operation of error, they may believe falsehood, that all may be judged to have not believed the truth, but have preferred wickedness. Close quote. So who exactly is going to be deceived? The men that don't want to hear the truth, because it'll hurt. Because it means they'll have to swallow their pride and to change their sinful and disordered ways of life and ways of thinking. The men who'd rather have their leaders affirm them in their sins and lie to them than correct their false beliefs and vices and perhaps hurt their feelings. The men who do not love the truth and refuse to receive it. Men who would rather believe false words from false teachers than believe the true words of the true word of God. And as we've seen, the men who are seduced by these lies are seduced because they want to be seduced. The men who are seduced by these lies are seduced because they want to be seduced. Since they don't love the truth, God will let them have what they do want and what they do love, which is the lie. Now, how do men get in this condition? Generally speaking, it starts with little compromises. Now, in one sense, of course, we all have to compromise in life, whether we're going to eat this or that, whether we're going to go here or there. Those sort of compromises are just part of the give and take of, of life. That's a given. But what we must never do is compromise at the level of truth or the level of principle. To love the truth, to be willing to suffer for the truth, is a grace. It's a grace. We need to pray for it, and we need to protect it and nourish it. Not sin against it by compromising at the levels of principles, the level of truth. A man starts by making a small compromise on a manner of principle. That first compromise is the hardest one. But then it gets easier and easier if he doesn't repent. One compromise leads to another, and then another, and another, and another. Finally, the man has no principles to speak of. He's blinded himself. He's lost his integrity. And what did he sacrifice it for? What did he sacrifice it for? All too often, he sacrificed his integrity so he could fit in with a crowd. He sacrificed his integrity because he was way more worried about what others think than about what was the right thing to do or believe or defend. He sacrificed his integrity because he was unable or unwilling to deny himself. He was unwilling to suffer for the truth, for standing for what was right. And that also explains why perversities are so often associated with these sort of men. The mind was made to know truth. If a man deliberately rejects the truth and embraces falsehood, in other words, if he uses his mind for things it wasn't made for, it shouldn't be much of a surprise that he may very well end up winding his, using his body for things it wasn't made for. What does it mean to say that God will send him the operation of error? They may believe falsehood, that all may be judged who have not believed the truth, but have preferred wickedness. The Hadock commentary explains this means that God shall allow them to be deceived by lying wonders and false miracles as a punishment of their not loving the truth. In other words, when it says God will send them the operation of error, it doesn't mean that he'll cause them to believe lies, after all, God desires the salvation of all men, and it would actually be heretical to hold otherwise. It doesn't mean that God will cause them 
to believe the lies, but rather that as a just punishment for their rejection of the known truth, as a just punishment for their willful and stubborn blindness and error, he will withdraw his grace and thus permit them to be received by the Antichrist. That's where all these compromises on the matters of truth and principle led them, right into the arms of the Antichrist. When it says that the reason this will happen is, quote, that all may be judged who have not believed the truth, but preferred wickedness, close quote, the Greek word used here for judge means to be judged, condemned, and punished for refusing to believe the truth. Those who don't want to follow Christ, who don't want to believe the teaching of his church, those who want to live the way they want to live, will believe the lie and follow the Antichrist. It's terrifying. It's really terrifying. We're also told who is not going to be deceived, St. Paul. But we, brethren, beloved of God, are bound to give thanks to God always for you, because God has chosen you as first fruits unto salvation through the sanctification of the Spirit and belief of the truth. Close quote. The operation of error and the marvels and seduction of Antichrist will not deceive those who love and believe in the truth. In May of 1897, Pope Leo XIII stated his encyclical on the Holy Spirit, quote, Whosoever faileth by weakness or ignorance may perhaps have some excuse before Almighty God, but he who resists the truth through malice and turns away from it sins most grievously against the Holy Ghost, close quote. He who resists the truth through malice and turns away from it sins most grievously against the Holy Ghost. We're all familiar with that terrifying statement. It's something said by our Lord. You can find it in Mark 3, 29, quote, He that shall blaspheme against the Holy Ghost shall never have forgiveness, but shall be guilty of an everlasting sin, close quote. Resisting the known truth is one of his sins against the Holy Ghost. And I quote from a standard Catholic reference work. In particular, deliberate resistance to the known truth may be regarded as specially directed against the work of the Holy Ghost in the soul. Generally, the soul hearts the soul to the inspirations of grace that repentance is unlikely. Close quote. Back to Leo XIII. Whosoever faileth by weakness or ignorance may perhaps have some excuse before Almighty God, but he who resists the truth through malice and turns away from it sins most grievously against the Holy Ghost. In our days, this sin has become so frequent. He's writing in 1897. In our days, this sin has become so frequent that those dark times seem to have come which were foretold by St. Paul, in which men, blinded by the just judgment of God, should take falsehood for truth and should believe in the prince of this world, who is a liar and the father thereof, as a teacher of truth. As it says in 2 Thessalonians 2.10 and 1 Timothy 4.1, God shall send them the operation of error to believe lying. In the last time, some shall depart from the faith, giving heeds to spirit of error, the doctrine of devils. Close quote. The Vicar of Christ. You're in very good company if you've been thinking we may well be living in those terrible times. Our Lord said, The truth will set you free. I don't want to hear it. Our Lord said, the truth will set you free. My mind is made up. I don't want to change my ways. 
The Lord said, the truth will set you free. I want to keep my options open. The Lord said, the truth will set you free. I don't think we need to get extreme here. The Lord said, the truth will set you free. It's not that black and white. The Lord said, the truth will set you free. I don't want people to think I'm some kind of fundamentalist. The Lord said, the truth will set you free. It can't be that bad. Everybody does it. The Lord said, the truth will set you free. I can't help it. I've been this way my whole life. Today, and I mean today, before you leave Mass, don't put it off. Before you leave today, take the time to seriously search your mind and your heart. Seriously. And ask yourself, am I open to the truth, no matter what it costs? Am I a truth seeker? Or am I resistant to the truth that's far no farther? It's the most important question you can ever ask yourself. Ask yourself. If the Antichrist appeared this week, whose camp would I be in? If I'm alive when the Antichrist appears, whose camp will I be in? Whose camp will I be in? He who resists the truth through malice and turns away from it sins most grievously against the Holy Ghost. The church must pass through a final trial in the form of religious deception offering men an apparent solution to their problems at the price of apostasy from the truth.